Operation Christmas Child boxes are starting to stack up. That's also a beautiful sight. We're here to worship, worship our everlasting God. Let's stand together, church, as we worship the strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Just thinking about how 
babies that's going to be oh, doing the bills today. These are our children. And we thank God for what he's doing. And again, uh, we're going to move on in him and have your way, Father God, as we let the Holy Ghost have his way with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue worshiping this morning, church.
you guys so much for that. And, and what, what a privilege it is. I mean, and I know I've got my own kids up here who I'm excited to see. But, I, you know, I think we're, we're all blessed when we just have an opportunity to hear from the kids. Amen. And seeing them take their, their simple opportunities to serve. And with that, I want to lead you to this week's newsletter by one of our elders, Don Wynn, also calling all of us to take, to look for our opportunities to serve God by. It's, it's no less beautiful in the eyes of God. As, as, El, as Luster says all the time, we're all God's children. So when God's looking down, he's looking at you serving the same way we look at all these kids. Right? So let's be God's people who, who choose to serve as his children in his family. So thank you kids for a, a great example of what it looks like to be an active part of the body of Christ this morning. Thank you for that. This morning though, as, uh, as we worship, um, I have, uh, have a couple of announcements that I need to make up front here because we are at that point of the year where the annual meeting is coming up in two weeks. Amen. Our annual meeting is coming up in two weeks, where we all gather right after the second service, um, and, and we discuss some of the business of the church. We have, we have people who are nominated to different positions of, uh, of elder, of trustees, of, of uh, secretary, as, and let's see here, I've got one more yet, I think. Uh, and treasurer, treasurer, there we go. Um, and so if you'd like to take a look, there are, uh, there are hard copies that you can grab from the, uh, from the, the Welcome Center or the green table in the uh, upper room. As well as if, if we're all out there, we have more in the office on Becky's desk. You're welcome to talk to Becky or Pastor Taylor or myself and we'll get those for you. Uh, we vote on those. We also vote on the, the year's budget coming up for 2022. Uh, you can grab that also. You can look at that out in the Welcome Center or in the, uh, on the green table in the upper room. And we encourage you to do that soon, right? Now, I know we, we plan for our annual meeting right after the service on that Sunday, which means you don't get to leave and have lunch until we're done. So the more conversation we can have about the budget, about the nominations, about all those things beforehand, the smoother the meeting goes that Sunday, right? Now, this is not done as manipulation, but we distinctly encourage you to come and have that dialogue, have that conversation beforehand. That's the best place to do it. So, we invite you to do that. Uh, do your due diligence in taking a look at things and coming to ask the questions that you have. But then at the annual meeting, uh, everyone is welcome, only members are able to vote. So if that's something that you're thinking, wow, I want to take part in being able to make these decisions, we invite you to come to talk to Pastor Taylor and myself uh, about membership. We'd be happy uh, to, to look at that with you and, and receiving you in membership uh, of your church. Because th this is the one place of the year where, where membership uh, has its one little perk. So uh, uh, we don't have too many drawbacks that I know of. You know, there's, there's, uh, there's, there's no other, no trip to the Caribbean. There, there's also no uh, annual fees either uh, to membership. So uh, we, we invite you to consider that at, at this point. So November 14th. Uh, right after the second service will be our annual meeting. So, right now, uh, as we uh, as we get ready uh, to continue on uh, in the in the back of the table by our media booth, or if you're in the upper room by the green table, there's a table there with two cards. One says, "Welcome." If you're visiting with us, we want to connect with you. We want to help you to discover where some places are that you can get plugged in, and we invite you to fill out some information there uh, for us so that we can do that. There's also a card for your prayer requests because your prayers matter to us. The, the concerns, the things going on in your life and the lives of people around you, they matter to us. We want to be interceding on your behalf for those things. So I invite you to grab one of those cards and fill them out and then put those in the white receptacle on that table. Also in that white receptacle is a uh, space for your tithes and offerings each week. So with that, let's take a moment and pray and then we'll have our video announcements this morning. Heavenly Father, we give you because you are a good God. God, we, we even as we just say,
sin, we would come before you humbly because of your majesty and the mystery of your great love for us. What an incredible thing that we can in no way earn in this life. So we thank you for it, Jesus. Father, as we worship to you today, would you be glorified? Would our songs, would our words, would our hearts, would our fellowship uh, glorify your name? We just want to give a huge thank you to everybody who's participated in keeping our food pantry stocked. Thank you very, very much. It continues to be used in incredible ways. We do ask that you continue to check out the newsletter to find out what items are needed each and every week as you continue to bring those things for shelf life, our food pantry. Operation Christmas Child boxes are due Sunday, November 14th. If you haven't yet, grab a box and all the information that you need from the table out in the foyer and get shopping. Then after you've packed it up, bring it back to the table and drop it off there so that we can get these boxes sent out to people around the world for Christmas. Hi guys, Dave here. Just uh, it's that time of year again. I can't believe it's already almost November. We've got the pie auction coming up. Uh, what a huge event for the youth at our church. Uh, our church is always such a giving church and this pie auction, it's used to help send kids to either summer camp up at the Yellowstone Alliance camp or to the Life Conference. And, and for this year, it's the Life Conference. We're, uh, we're headed to Orlando again. It's going to be a great experience. I can't wait. I already got kids signed up. Um, but the pie auction, that, that helps finance it. So it's uh, November 21st, right after church. Kids will be downstairs. They'll be uh, uh, feeding you, uh, getting you water, just taking good care of you. And then the pie auction will take over after that, and we'll try to sell as many of those baked goods as we can. Pies, cakes, cinnamon rolls, whatever your taste is. But I need to get a list on who wants to uh, uh, donate those to the, to the youth. If you can give me a call or Becky a call, I'd appreciate that, because we usually top out at about 35 or 40 items. So if you can just give me a call as soon as you can, we can get that list going and uh, get on with some good eats for Thanksgiving that's out the following weekend. Have a good day, guys. I just wanted to come on here and invite you all out to the holiday market. It's going to be on November 5th and 6th. Mercy Market, which is the ministry of the Alliance, is going to be here. And we would love your support. It's going to be downstairs in the fellowship hall. Check the newsletter for more details. It's 8 o'clock. I'm going to be late for church. <coughs> Nobody here. Daylight savings time is over. It's only 7 o'clock for all the rest of you. So now that I'm here an hour early, what am I going to do? I know. I've got an hour to pray. A fallback video to the beer. But make sure your clocks fall back an hour next Saturday night or you'll be here by yourself for an hour to pray as well. I thought maybe that was going to be an announcement for our Left Behind series. <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple of things, just uh, by way of mentioning also, um, for those that aren't aware, I, I know uh, David, our youth director, talked about life, and most all of you probably know what life is, but maybe not everybody does. Life is a conference for high school youth that's done every three years, it's, it's all of the Alliance youth that can come. I mean, there's thousands of students at this conference. There's speakers, things geared directly towards high school age students. And, and the one thing I can tell you is we have had more students through the years who, live, who their lives were profoundly impacted at the Life Conference. It's always a more expensive trip. Um, and so I really want to encourage you, if you are looking to buy an overpriced pie, <laughs> the pie auction is the place to go. Amen. And um, all those dollars do go towards sending the youth on their trips. But, but Life Conference is a, 
It's usually a once in a high school career opportunity. Um, sometimes if your birthday falls right, you can get it twice, but uh, to go and be poured into with thousands of other high school um, students from around the world, even some of our international workers students come back for life. And so great opportunity to get behind our youth, send them off and uh, be praying for them. The other thing I wanted to mention really quick too, just by way of reminder, um, Pastor Siebert was talking about the annual meeting, the budget, the nominations that we're voting on. I just want to remind everybody for a moment how the process works. Since about September, our budget committee has been working, putting together a budget, talking to all of our ministry leads, seeing what they need for the upcoming year, putting that into a budget. Um, and our nominating committee has been working, putting together a nomination slate. So we have committees that are put together comprised of people, uh, of members from the church and some elders working on putting that together. The nominations and the budget then go to the elder committee for, or to the elder board for approval. They vote on that and approve it. And then it comes to the congregation for a final approval. So that really is the process. You have a committee that's been working on putting it together, the elder board that's overseeing it and voting on it, and then the final authority is the congregation. So it's an important meeting to be at. Um, that's the way the process works, and we vote on um, offices for the coming, um, sometimes two years or three years, depending on the office, and then also for the operational budget for the coming year. And so, again, I just want to let everybody understand what the process is. There's lots of checks and balances in it, from committees to elder board to congregation. It's a good process, and we really do believe that the Lord makes his will known through that process. And so I um, invite you to come. If you're not an active member, you can still come. You can ask questions. You can have input. Um, as Pastor Siebert mentioned, the only difference is voting privileges are reserved for those who hold active membership. And so I just want to take a moment and just clarify that. Just to remind us, or maybe for those who are new, that's how we do things here at um, Shine Alliance. And, and I do, like I said, think it's a, it's a very good process. It gets a lot of voices in it, but above all, the voice of God. That's what we want. We want to hear the Lord's will and put that into um, place for the coming year. We've sung a song about our everlasting God. We've sung a song about our awesome God. We're going to sing a song now that talks about how great is our God. And that's what we're here to do. We're here to worship our, our great and awesome and everlasting God. He is so worthy of our prayers. And we want to come before him in spirit and in truth and, and glorify his name through song, through prayer, through attitude, through action. So church, I invite you to, uh, you can stand, you can sit, you can kneel, raise your hands, pray, sing, uh, just meditate on the words. Respond as you feel led to respond today to our great and our awesome God. Let's worship together.
the things that I tend to complain about are pretty ridiculous. However, as we all know, there are serious things that happen in life from time to time. And this world is full of evil and injustice, and we may find ourselves complaining to God about it. Oppressed people groups, racial violence, extreme poverty, global terrorism, Christian persecution, these are serious things, and many people suffer in unbelievable ways. This morning, as we continue our study through the book of Habakkuk, we are going to see some complaining to God going on. Habakkuk, he's looking around at his current situation, and, and there are many things that he does not like. And so he lifts them up to the Lord by way of complaints. Now, in order to see what's going on, I want to direct your attention to Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. If you remember last week, we looked at verse 1, and we're introduced to this book that we're going to be going through for a few weeks. And so we're going to be in chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 to start. Let me just read this to you. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help? and you will not hear. Or cry to you, violence, and you will not save. Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Wow. Habakkuk 
Habakkuk is looking around at the landscape, and all that he can see is injustice and strife. That's all Habakkuk sees as he looks around at the situation. He sees injustice. He sees strife. As far as he can see, that's all that is happening right now. Now, we talked about this some last week. Judah, the kingdom in which he finds himself, had become morally and spiritually bankrupt. Now, without rehashing everything that we talked about last week, just, again, understand, Judah had completely fallen apart. People were living according to their own greedy self-interests without any thought for other people or any thought for the Lord. It's sort of like the last verse in the book of Judges, chapter 21, verse 25, where we read this. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And for anyone that's read the book of Judges lately, you know how corrupt the people had become. Everyone was just doing whatever they wanted to do without any thought for other people, without any thought for the Lord. And this is what Habakkuk is witnessing, and he cannot believe what he sees. He, he cannot believe what society had become. As far as he can tell, people are absolutely getting away with immoral behavior without any consequences whatsoever. There is no justice in his mind. In verse 3, he states very plainly that destruction and violence and strife and contention are everywhere. And he cannot understand why the Lord is just letting it happen. You may have wondered some of these same things lately. We watch the news and we see accounts of violence and protests rioting going on in some of our cities right here in the United States. And we wonder why the Lord is just letting this happen. God, don't you see what's going on? Don't you care? We, we watch the situation at our southern border unfold and we wonder, where is the justice for these oppressed people? Put yourself in the shoes of these people that they have nowhere to go without facing cartels and poverty and sickness and violence. Where, where do they go? What do they do? Where's the justice? We see the way that believers in the Middle East are treated, and we wonder, where is God at? Doesn't he care? Doesn't he see? Well, this is where Habakkuk is at. He is wondering how long and why, when he looks at all the turmoil around him, Habakkuk believes that God is letting sin go unpunished, which, which results in no justice for the oppressed people. God's just letting it go. Sin is having its way. There's no punishment. There's no justice. Oppressed people are suffering. As he looks at the state of Judah, he can hardly believe that God's letting this go on. This is the es essence of Habakkuk's plea of how long, O oh Lord, how long? And because of this, Habakkuk is beginning to wonder if God even cares. God, do you care about all this that's going on? Unfortunately, this is often the result when injustice seems to go unpunished. We wonder if God even cares about the situation. God has put his law in place. It's very clear Rarely is sin a result of not knowing whether or not something is wrong or right. That's rarely the case. But even the best law in the world profits nothing if its statutes are not maintained. If you have laws on the book and no one enforces them, what good is that? We see this very thing going on today in America. We know it's wrong. I don't think anybody wonders if it's wrong to vandalize a business, break out store windows, steal everything inside. Yet, as these things go on in cities around our nation, there is no justice for those business owners because the criminals go absolutely unpunished. I don't think there's a lot of confusion as to whether or not Washington elites should manipulate tax codes and political campaign contributions to increase their personal wealth, yet it goes on with no consequence. 
The list could go on and on, but I think you get the picture. Where's the justice? And this is what Habakkuk is pleading with the Lord. And I think we can understand where he's coming from. And, and I know for a lot of us, in Cheyenne, Wyoming, we're somewhat isolated from some of the things going on in our major cities. Now, I grew up in South Chicago, and when I talk to people that live back in those areas, it's so different than what it was like when I grew up. And people are fleeing and they're leaving. And, and, but I think we can understand to a degree what it is that Habakkuk is, is seeing. But however, with all of that said, and having an understanding about why Habakkuk is complaining, I want you to realize that Habakkuk's biggest complaint is unanswered prayer. That's his biggest complaint. God, I am crying out to you. I am lifting this up day and night, and you don't even answer me, and nothing is changing, and that is his biggest complaint, is God is not answering these heartfelt prayers. Habakkuk is disappointed that God doesn't seem to be answering his prayers. In Habakkuk's mind, justice has been perverted. He has cried out to the Lord about this over and over, and God seems to be ignoring him. How long will God let this go on, even as Habakkuk is crying out to the Lord in earnest, heartfelt prayer? And he concludes that the law is paralyzed, justice never goes forth, and in fact, it's been perverted. Now imagine for a moment, if you're at the Cheyenne Depot Plaza, you're enjoying a, a, a late afternoon event and, and the Cheyenne's putting on for the community. Families are there and everyone's having a great time. And while you're there, a couple of young men attack an elderly woman, taking her purse, knocking her down, and then they start kicking her while she's lying on the ground. Now, fortunately, there's a couple of policemen just 10 feet away talking to each other, but their backs are to the situation. And so you run towards them, crying out for help. They hear you, they turn, and they look at the altercation, and then they simply turn around and continue the conversation. They simply ignore the injustice, and they ignore your plea for intervention. Would you be angry at those policemen? Yes, absolutely, and justifiably so. In a sense, this is what Habakkuk is feeling. Injustice is rampant. Innocent people are suffering. He is crying out to God to intervene, and God simply seems to be ignoring the evil that is going on all around him. And, and this evil was causing Habakkuk to doubt God. And let's be honest, the same thing can happen to us at times. Things can get difficult. It seems like violence and immorality is winning. We cry out to God in earnest prayer, and there is no answer, and we begin to wonder if God really cares when he seems so silent. Now, the interesting thing about the book of Habakkuk is that we get to see Habakkuk's complaint to the Lord, but we also get to see God's answer. Habakkuk has been crying out to the Lord about the current situation, God seems silent, and so Habakkuk tells God, he's sick of it. I'm tired of this, God. And God answers him. Listen to verses 5 through 11. This is the Lord speaking now to Habakkuk. He says, look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe it told. For behold, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, who marched through the breadth of the earth, to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swift to devour. They all come for violence. All their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on, guilty men whose own might is their God. Now, there are a number of intriguing things about God's answer to Habakkuk. But the first is that unbeknownst to Habakkuk, God's already been answering his prayers. Habakkuk 
doesn't realize this. He's been crying out. God seems so. God's already been answering his prayers, even as he's been praying them. God doesn't disagree that Judah has sinned greatly. He does not tell Habakkuk that he is wrong in his assessment of what is happening. You're right, Habakkuk. It's gotten really bad. Something needs to happen. And God basically says, hey, I'm doing something already. Not I will do something. I am doing something. Habakkuk, he'd been crying out to the Lord for some time. Nothing seemed to be changing. However, contrary to Habakkuk's perception, God was at work. In a sense, God tells Habakkuk, keep your eyes open, my man. I'm already at work, and what I'm going to do is going to blow you away. The problem was not that God wasn't doing anything, but rather what he was about to do was going to floor Habakkuk. In other words, God is already answering Habakkuk's prayer, but in a totally unexpected way. God's answer is astounding. Habakkuk, he knew that evil needed to be punished. He just had no idea the way in which God was going to go about it. And in verse 5, God tells Habakkuk that what he is doing is unbelievable. You couldn't comprehend it even if I told you. And with that said, God tells him anyway. God is raising up and sending the Chaldeans, which again was the southern ethnic tribe of the Babylonians. That he was sending them to come and judge Judah. They are going to come and they are going to overthrow Judah in a way that they had never seen. The Babylonians will take violence to a whole new level. God is saying to Habakkuk, hey, I'm aware of all that you're telling me. I have it taken care of. You're just not going to like what I'm about to do. These are hard things to comprehend. Hard things to hold on to, but hold on to them we must. God is in control. God is in control of everything. He is always in control. No matter how difficult things may get, God is aware and he is in control. If everything falls apart around you, God is in control of that. If you get that diagnosis that floors you, God is in control of that. If relationships fall apart, no matter how hard you have tried to reconcile, God is in control of everything. Also, God will do what it takes to bring about both justice and repentance. Even using other wicked nations as his tool to bring it about. Judgment, when it comes, would be swift and devastating. We're all frantic about some of the rising tensions with China and the East and North Korea and oh, what's going on? God's in control. He's in control. Maybe we need some judgments. Who knows? But he is in control of everything. You know, I mentioned this last week. I am not a prophet. I don't have that gift. And I've not received some word from the Lord. But could it be that God has brought this global pandemic upon the world for his tool of judgment and justice? I'm not saying for sure that is what happened. But neither am I dismissing it. There's a lot of injustice and sin in the world. God is in control. And he will bring about what is needed and always on time. So what does this mean for us today? Right here in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Well, I believe there are three things that we need to keep in mind when God seems silence. And I want to finish up with that this morning. The first point to remember is simply this. God hears every prayer. God hears every prayer. Listen to Isaiah 65, 24. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. Listen also to Psalm 34, 17. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. God loves you. God cares for you. 
God hears you. He always does. When God seems silent, you have to remind yourself of this fact. God is aware of your trouble. In fact, I would submit he's more aware of your trouble than you are. Because he knows the attitude of your heart. He knows about things behind the scene that you have no knowledge of. When the enemy tries to confuse you and to discourage you because God seems silent, you must rebuke him. Because God hears you. He always does. The Lord hears every cry. He sees every tear. And he loves you more than you could possibly imagine. God hears your prayer. The next point when God seems silent is don't walk away. Rather, press into the Lord even harder because he's listening. When God seems silent, don't quit. Don't walk away. Don't give up. Oh, I'm not going to church anymore. I'm not praying anymore. I'm not reading my Bible anymore. Don't do that. No, press in to God even harder. He hears you. Pulling away is not going to help you. That's what the enemy wants you to do. Press in. It's so easy to just throw up our hands and quit when it seems like the Lord is silent. However, you have to do exactly the opposite. And this is an opportunity to seek the Lord in greater depth. This is an opportunity to walk by faith and not by sight. This is an opportunity to lean into the Lord, our sure foundation, when everything else seems to be sinking sand. Faith is forged through fire, just like metal. And just like metal, when it's subjected to the flame, it's strengthened. And so is our faith. God may be delaying his answer because there are other things that need to take place for a great blessing to occur that you have no knowledge of. You can't have knowledge of it. You don't have the mind of God. He's working things together in ways that we cannot possibly understand. Trust him. Press into him. Continue to pray in faith and do not give up. Your faith will be strengthened and you will grow deeper in love with the Lord through it. The last point to remind yourself of is that sometimes sin can get in the way of our prayers and hinder them. I'm not going to discount that. Sometimes it's sin in you that's getting in the way. So if confession and repentance are needed, then it's time to confess and repent. Listen to Psalm 66, 18. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have risen. This verse is indicating that if we are entertaining sin and not dealing with it before the Lord, He will not listen to our prayers. He hears them but he doesn't listen to them. We also know from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, Husbands, your prayers are hindered when you do not live with your wives in an understanding way. That's scripture. The reality is, unconfessed sin creates blockages in our relationship with the Lord, and blockages in our relationship renders our prayers ineffective. Sin needs to be dealt with for our prayers to be effective and for the Lord to truly listen to them. So if God seems silent, take some time, ask the Holy Spirit to search your heart, see if there is any sin that needs to be taken care of. If there is, confess it. Agree with God and then repent. Turn the other way so that your prayers are powerful and effective, reaching the throne room of heaven. And then know that God hears you. And God is working. He's bringing things about at the right time, in the right way, and maybe doing things behind the scenes first that you just don't have knowledge of, and you can't. Life is hard. Difficult things will come. I know for many of us, this past year and a half has been so difficult. And in many ways, there seems to be no end in sight. COVID still rages. Political tensions are on the rise. Inflation, that's a real threat on the horizon. It's even starting to, to sort of 
come on to the shore. Marginal people groups are subjected to horrendous circumstances. The list could go on. Many of us have been crying out to God, and he seems silent. Take heart. God hears you. He's already answering. And we would not believe what he is doing, even if he were to tell us. Don't give up. Press into God even harder. He loves you. He hears you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this word and, and so much of what Habakkuk is saying we can resonate with. And Father, I, I just pray for each and every one of us that you would encourage us in our spirit. Maybe we don't see the answer to prayer or, or you seem silent, but Lord, may today encourage us to continue on, to seek you in greater depths, to press into you, to love you more and more. Lord, we know you're in control. We know you have things covered. We don't have to worry about that. We've said so often, you're not up in heaven wringing your hands, wondering what to do about this thing. You've got it. You've had it since before the foundations of the earth. And we need to be people who walk in faith and not by sight. May we be an example to our family, to our friends, to our neighbors what it means to really trust you when you seem silent. And so Lord, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to take some time uh, to celebrate communion today. And, you know, so long ago, uh, God was not silent. He sent his son to come and, and to die in our place that we could have life. And we remember that monthly with communion. And again, uh, with the COVID thing is going on. We're continuing with these self-contained um, cups. You pull back the top film and the, the wafer's there. And then you pull back the second film and that opens up the cup for the juice. And so um, we sing a couple of songs here at Shine Life Church. And anyone can participate in communion. If you belong to God through Jesus Christ, we want you to celebrate with us. And so um, as this first song is playing, you can come up and, and grab these cups and uh, go back to your seats, and then I'll, I'll lead you through some things, and we'll have a, a second song, and, and we'll um, partake together. So, uh, again, um, we want you to participate with us. We want you to celebrate. You can sing these songs. You can meditate on the words. The reality is we need the Lord. We need the Lord more than we can possibly imagine. So use this time to simply sit your heart before God, thanking Him for what He's accomplished, that we can have forgiveness of sin, and that we can continue to cry out to Him. So come up and grab a cup as you feel that. I need Thee every hour, most gracious Lord, Lord, Stay down here. 
that top film exposes the wafer representing the body of Christ. We know from Scripture that our Lord Jesus went to the cross. He was bruised. He was pierced. He was crushed. For our sin, the punishment for sin was death. And he gave himself in a horrific death and took on all of the pain and the sorrow that sin had brought. He did it out of love. Father, we come before you today and we are very thankful for the body of Christ. Jesus, who willingly went to the cross, suffered in our place, and died, paying the penalty for our sin. We love you, we praise you, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake together today. Again, we'll have one more song before uh, taking the cup. We can use this as a time to reflect and to pray and to worship. the blood of Christ. Scripture says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin because life is found in the blood and death was required as the penalty for sin. Scripture also says the blood of bulls and rams was not sufficient, but the blood of Christ is sufficient to cover over all sin, all time, for all people. And Jesus willingly went and he shed his blood so that we could have life. Father, then we come before you again with grateful hearts for the cup of Christ, the blood so freely given that washes us clean and pure, sets us aright, and, and is a new covenant, an irrevocable agreement that we can belong to you, that nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ yeah. Jesus. And for that, we say thank you from the very bottom of our heart. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake together. Amen, church. I'm going to invite the praise team to come up. We're going to close with one last song here today.
Church, I cannot emphasize enough that God hears you, He loves you, He is working in your situation no matter what it is. And you have to hold on to that. You have to hold on to that, church. God is always moving, always. He's in control. And I know that sometimes we have difficult circumstances. I get it. And I know some of you are going through difficult things. But for, for God's sake, don't pull away and quit. That is the worst possible thing you can do. Press into God, be surrounded by his people, and cry out to him in faith, knowing that he hears you, he loves you, and he is moving on your behalf. Let's stand together. Let's close with one last song, really a celebration that that is who our God is.
Father, we can trust you. We can lean on you. We can press into you that you love us. And so, Lord, we say thank you. As we go from this place, may you continue to minister to our hearts and minds, helping us to understand who you are, how you do things, and that you are trustworthy beyond our wildest imagination. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen, church. Have a great Sunday. Enjoy Bible community. We'll see you next week.